بسم الله الحمد لله الصلاة والسلام على رسول الله نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Welcome to this special show our Prophet Musa عليه السلام Now this month, the month of Muharram gives us a unique opportunity to speak about the special relationship which our Ummah, the Muslim Ummah has with the Prophet Musa, Moses alayhi salam. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi salam connected the month of Muharram with Allah's name when he described it as Shahrullah, the month of Allah. It is one of the four sacred months and it is a month which the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam singled out for fasting. Uh, Ibn Abbas radiallahu an describes that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam was never ever keen to fast a day more than the day of Ashura, which is the 10th of Muharram. And the Prophet ﷺ was also never keen to fast a month more than the uh, month of Ramadan, of course. Now, what many people do not realize about this special day of fasting, the day of Ashura, the 10th of Muharram, is in fact it used to be obligatory. Before the legislation of the month of Ramadan, the Muslims from the time of the Meccan period were commanded, obligated to fast the 10th of Muharram, the day of Ashura. Many people are unaware of this. So never underestimate the importance of fasting this particular day because it was at the beginning of the revelation obligatory for all Muslims. Would you be shocked to know that even the pagans, the Quraysh, from their historical traditions, they used to fast this day. They used to consider the 10th of Muharram a very sacred month indeed, uh, a very sacred day indeed. They used to use this day, the 10th of Muharram, as the day when they would change the kiswa, the cloth around the Kaaba. And they used to, as a tradition, fast this day. And the Prophet ﷺ instituted the fasting of the 10th of Muharram as part of the message. But the special connection with Musa alayhi salam occurred when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam went to Medina. Again, the Sahabi ibn Abbas narrates that when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam came to Medina, he found that the Jewish tribes were fasting on a particular day. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam inquired, what is this day you are fasting? And they responded that it is a great day in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, saved Musa and his people and he drowned the Pharaoh and his people. So we fast out of gratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for this. Now listen to what the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said. We are more deserving and are closer to Musa alayhi salam than you. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa fasted this day and he ordered the companions also to fast this day. But of course, with the legislation of uh, Ramadan, uh, Ramadan became the obligatory fasting and the 10th of Muharram, the day of Ashura, became the optional fasting, the sunnah fasting. But it is a highly stressed, confirmed sunnah that we really, really should be reviving. Now, Ibn Hajar, uh, 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 Hajar al-Asqalani, the great uh, interpreter of Sahih al-Bukhari, in interpreting this hadith, he mentioned three levels to fasting this day. The first, the basic level, is you just fast the 10th of Muharram. The second level is actually found in another hadith of the Prophet ﷺ where he said, if I'm given life to next year, I will fast the day before and the 10th of Muharram. So that's the 9th and the 10th. That's the second level. And the best level, the third level, is that you fast the day before Muharram and the day after Muharram. Uh, uh, the day before Ashura and the day after Ashura. So that's the 9th, the 10th, and the 11th. And that distinguishes you clearly from the fasting of the people of the book. So the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam made a strong and unique connection with the Prophet Musa alayhi salam. I wonder... If you've ever reflected on how strong the connection of our Ummah is with the Prophet Musa alayhi salam. First of all, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, when he was in Isra wal Mi'raj, and when one of the greatest commands was delivered 
to the Prophet ﷺ, and it was not delivered through Jibreel ﷺ. The Prophet ﷺ ascended through the heavens and he went to the farthest lot tree, and then he was in the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, closer to Allah than uh, any other of creation has ever been. And it is there that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala legislated the daily prayers, the salawat, the second pillar of Islam. But we all know the story, don't we? That the initial legislation was 50 prayers a day. But when the Prophet ﷺ returned, he was intercepted by Musa, who, who implored the Prophet ﷺ, go back to Allah and ask for a reduction. And this asking for a reduction, it was reduced to 45. And it kept on being reduced. It kept on being reduced until the Prophet ﷺ was so shy because he had been reduced down to five daily prayers. And then Musa asked again, go back to Allah and ask for a further reduction. But the Prophet ﷺ said, I am shy now to return to my Lord. So it's because of that dialogue between the Prophet ﷺ and Musa that we have our daily five, uh, de uh, our daily five prayers, which could have been 50 prayers. But of course, uh, we still have the reward of 50 prayers because all good, good deeds are multiplied by a minimum of 10 times. So our second pillar of Islam has a strong connection to the Prophet Musa alayhi salam. And even the third pillar, fasting, were you aware that the famous hadith of the Prophet alayhi salam, that the odor from the mouth of a fasting person is more beloved to Allah than musk was actually a principle which began in the time of Musa alayhi salam. When Musa alayhi salam was ordered to go into seclusion, which we know in the Quran as 40 days, it was initially 30 days. But because Musa alayhi salam was so worried about the smell emanating from his mouth, and he knew he would be speaking to Allah and receiving the commandments, the 10 commandments, he broke his fast. And according to some narrations, uh, he was then ordered to fast another 10 days and the exact same Hadith was mentioned to Musa alayhi salam that the odor coming from the mouth of a fasting person is more beloved to Allah than musk. Also, in terms of um, size of nation, uh, Musa alayhi salam, uh, when the nations were paraded before the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam in Isra wal Mi'raj, he found Musa alayhi salam crying because uh, the Prophet Sallallahu nation was the greatest nation of all. But the second greatest nation in terms of number and size was the nation of Banu Israel. Also the Prophet Sallallahu in Isra wal Mi'raj, when he was actually traveling from Mecca to Jerusalem, he saw Musa Alayhi uh, Salam in his grave praying, standing and praying. This is a unique privilege given to the Prophets that they can pray in their graves. And again in Masjid Al-Aqsa, when uh, the Prophet ﷺ led all the Prophets in prayer, it was of course Musa salam that was in that congreg uh, congregation. Now, that's just some of the connections with Musa salam in terms of acts of worship. The connection becomes even stronger when we look at the Qur'an. The Prophet Musa salam simply is the most oft-mentioned person in the entire Qur'an. He is mentioned approximately 136 times, which is far more than anybody else is mentioned by name in the Quran. His mention begins in Surah Al-Baqarah, right towards the beginning of the Quran, and his final mention is of course in Surah Al-A'la. Inna hadha lafi suhufi al-Ula, suhufi Ibrahim wa Musa. So our book, our scripture, our revelation has a strong connection to the Prophet Musa alayhi salam. And the message of the Prophet Musa alayhi salam uh, is central. His story is central to the message of the Quran. Now when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam was in Mecca and he was facing the most severest persecution and torture, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu about the story of Musa alayhi salam as a consolation. The Prophet Musa alayhi salam is the first Prophet which the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam hears about from the previous Prophets. In Surah Taha, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam, and Surah Taha is from the earliest surahs revealed to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi هَلْ أَتَاكَ حَدِيثُ مُوسَى Has the news come to you of the Prophet Musa? The Prophet ﷺ at this particular stage 
was being uh, humiliated by the Quraysh and they were even challenging the Quraysh that look how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has uh, or Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not created you for this purpose to suffer like this the irony is that they were torturing him they were persecuting him and yet they were saying oh Allah has not created you to suffer like this so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed surah Taha as a consolation to the Prophet sallallahu Taha ma anzalna alayka al-Qur'an li tashqa Taha we have not revealed the Qur'an to cause you any distress and the first prophet that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam hears about from the previous prophets wa hal ataka hadith Musa have you heard about the Prophet Musa and now the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam hears about the story of the Prophet Musa as a consolation if the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is suffering then he now hears about a prophet who suffered more whose enemies were greater more numerous even in the Quran in surah al-Ghafir Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the 23rd uh, and 24th verse and we did certainly send Musa with our signs and a clear authority to Pharaoh Haman and Qarun but they said he is a magician and a liar you see Musa alayhi salam did not just have to face the Pharaoh he was the figurehead he was the archetypal tyrant he was the boastful tyrant and dictator who was the head of the society. But along with him, he had formidable uh, allies. There was Haman, who was the chief minister. He represents the political corruption, the ruling elite which support the leader and which institute oppression in society. And also there was Qarun. Now many people are not aware that Qarun actually was from Banu Israel and he was quite possibly one of the most wealthiest men ever to live in this world. The Quran describes that the keys, just the keys to his kunuz, to his treasures were so numerous and so great that those keys were kept in a particular chest of draw, a, a particular chest and that chest of drawers, it had to be carried by a large group of strong men. We're not talking about the treasure was heavy. We're talking about the keys to the treasures were so numerous that they were so heavy that a group of strong men had to carry them. So Musa had to face these three uh, corrupt, uh, influential elite. The Pharaoh, who represents the dictator, Haman, who represents the political corruption, and Qarun, who represents uh, hypocrisy, people who benefit, who enrich themselves uh, from the persecution of their own people. And he also represents the financial corruption, the bankrolling of this kind of society. So the Prophet ﷺ took great comfort from knowing that here was a Prophet who also faced the great challenges which the Prophet ﷺ was facing. And more significantly, here was a Prophet who was victorious, who was successful by the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now the Prophet ﷺ had the Sahaba to console him, to strengthen him, and they were fiercely loyal to the Prophet ﷺ. They were the purest and most talented people after the Prophets. Musa ﷺ had virtually nobody. He had his brother Harun, and besides that, he was constantly being annoyed, uh, being disobeyed by his own people, the Banu Israel. So not only did he have to face the corruption of Pharaoh, Haman and Qarun, but he also had to face the corruption of his own followers, who had been subjugated and slaughtered to such an extent that they had developed a slave mentality. That's why it's so important to be proud of your identity, to be proud of being a Muslim. Because once you start to swallow that subjugation, that racism, that prejudice, it affects your mindset. It makes you a person who's not willing to stand up for themselves. And you might even start turning on those people closest to you, like Banu Israel did with Musa alayhi salam. When he was on the gates of Jerusalem, Allah ordered them to go in and they would be victorious. And they said to Musa alayhi salam, 
You and your Lord go and fight, and we're going to sit right here. Can you believe that arrogance? Can you believe that rudeness? They had experienced great miracles, the parting of the sea, the staff of Moses, the hand of Moses. They had seen tremendous miracles, and they had seen the people of Pharaoh drowned by this stage. But due to that slave mentality, they're not able to sacrifice. They're not able to uh, strive in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In fact, from an ummah which numbered by this stage around 600,000, at this stage, Banu Israel are around 600,000. The Quran describes, Qala rajulani. Just two men stood up and were ready to fight with Moses and Harun. Allahu Akbar. So the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam had the companions. Musa alayhi salam had next to nothing in terms of companions. So this consoled the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. It, com- it comforted the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam and it reassured the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam that the messengers of Allah are always victorious. They always come out on top. Now, in one incident, a companion of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu was arguing with a Jewish man and actually struck him and said that our Prophet is greater than your Prophet. The Prophet Muhammad is greater than the Prophet Musa alayhi salam. Now, without a shadow of a doubt, that is an unequivocal truth. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa is the leader of the Anbiya and Mursaleen. He is the leaders of the Prophets and the Messengers. And this can be clearly seen in Isra wal Mi'raj when he led all the Prophets in prayer. He is the greatest of the Prophets and the final Prophet. But the Prophet ﷺ never liked for one Prophet to be in any way disrespected or preferred over another Prophet to the extent that the other Prophet is being disrespected. So the Prophet ﷺ said, Do not prefer Musa, uh, do not prefer me over Musa. On the day of rising, the day of resurrection, all people will faint and I will faint also. I will be the first to regain consciousness and I will see Musa alayhi salam grasping the throne of Allah. He will be grasping the throne of Allah. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam said, I do not know whether he was from amongst the people who fainted or whether he was exempted from that fainting. Subhanallah. This is a tremendous privilege for the Prophet Musa alayhi salam. And some scholars opine that it could possibly be that Musa is exempted from this fainting, uh, this tremendous event, because in his life he already fainted when the, uh, when the mountain, of course, crumbled before him. When he asked to see Allah and Allah responded that I will reveal myself to this mountain and if it remains, you will see me. And, if, uh, and of course, the mountain just, just was exposed to a glimmer from the veil of the light in front of Allah. Not Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals himself to the universe, the universe will disintegrate. But the veil of light which is in front of Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala exposed just a chink from that to the mountain and the mountain collapsed and Musa fainted. So he perhaps was exempt from the fainting of the hereafter because of what he experienced in this world. Now the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu saw Musa on a number of occasions. So he gave a very vivid description of what Musa alayhi salam looked like. The Prophet sallallahu said in an authentic uh, hadith that I saw uh, Musa dark-skinned, Adami. He was dark-skinned and this word Adami is used for somebody who is dark-skinned because Adam alayhi salam himself was dark-skinned. The Prophet ﷺ then described him as very hairy and powerfully built. The Prophet ﷺ also described him as tiwal, very tall. So he had a very striking appearance. A, he was dark skinned, he was hairy, and he was uh, very tall and powerfully built. Now, he was created by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the best of forms, but he had a quality of shyness and modesty which complemented his power and his strength. Now, Bani Israel, they very much resented this quality of his. Uh, One of their practices was to have communal bathing. They would get together and it would be kind of like a a kind of social occasion that they would bathe together, bathe naked, uh, go out into the open. 
Musa alayhi salam really did not like this. So he was very shy, uh, had a lot of haya, and he would go into seclusion and bathe privately near a waterfall or something like this. Now, in one particular occasion, it's a very famous hadith where Musa alayhi salam went into seclusion and he was bathing. Now, because Bani Israel did not like this practice, that he did not join them for their social bathing sessions, they started to spread rumors about him that he has leprosy, that he has some kind of skin condition, that, uh, that he has a problem. So when Musa alayhi salam was bathing in seclusion, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala caused a miracle to happen. The clothes which Musa alayhi salam had put on a rock while he was bathing, the rock came to life. The rock came to life and it rushed off with his clothes. And Musa alayhi salam grabbed his staff and ran after the rock and start, was started shouting at the rock, rock, come back with my clothes, come back with my clothes. And eventually he caught up with the rock and he smashed it four or five times. And the Prophet ﷺ said the marks can still be seen on that rock today. Now Bani Israel were then able to see Musa uh, right in front of them, almost by accident here. So now Musa salam is in front of Bani Israel and they can say, see that he is actually in the best of forms. He is a splendid man built uh, perfectly by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as mentioned in the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. But it gives you an insight into the mindset and the character of Bani Israel, how they used to annoy him, how they used to spread rumors against him. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran warned us, O you who believe, do not annoy your Prophet like Bani Israel used to annoy Musa and Allah cleared his name. This, according to some of the scholars of Tafsir, refers to this particular incident. Now Musa alayhi salam, he had another quality. He could not tolerate injustice at all. And he was quick to temper when it came to dealing with injustice. He was not the type of man who could just stand around when something wrong is happening in front of him. So in the famous incident uh, of when somebody from Bani Israel was arguing with one of the people of Pharaoh, uh, Musa alayhi salam stepped in and he struck the person from Pharaoh, فَقَضَى عَلَيْهِ The Qur'an describes and that man just dropped dead there and then. He didn't attempt, he didn't mean to kill him, but he was simply trying to defend somebody who he believed to be in the right. Musa had that character. He would step in when things were going wrong. When he escaped from Pharaoh and his people after the incident of this Egyptian man being killed, when he escaped, he went to Median in northern Saudi Arabia, modern day Saudi Arabia, a journey which would have taken around 10 days. Now, some of the scholars of Tafsir explained that his shoes would have been worn away. He was absolutely famished. He had no food, water, and he comes to a watering hole. And he notices at the watering hole two young ladies who are shy and keeping their sheep away. And he notices that the male shepherds are all around the watering hole, all feeding their sheep. Now, Musa alayhi salam at this stage is devastated, is close to death, but he steps in. He takes the sheep of the two ladies, he waters the sheep of the two ladies and he brings the sheep back uh, to the two ladies. SubhanAllah, this shows that despite his physical strength, despite his power, he was always humble, he was always caring and he was always helpful to those who had been treated unjustly or the weak. Now when he helped those two ladies, he didn't say to them, uh, okay, the least you can do is feed me. The least you can do is give me something to drink. Uh, the least you can do is give me a place to stay for the night to rest and recuperate. He in fact uh, does not even communicate with them. The Quran describes eloquently and perfectly, ثُمَّ تَوَلَّى إِلَى ظِلْ He turned away completely and headed towards the shade. Not actually went to the shade, he's so exhausted, he headed or faced the shade. Now our nature is when we do something good for people, oftentimes we want something in return. So we stand around looking for either some kind of reward, payment or even thanks. The Quran describes Musa, ثُمَّ تَوَلَّى إِلَى الظِّلْ He turned around completely and he faced or headed towards the shade. That was his nature, he was sincere. 
He did things for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He did not expect a gratitude from other people. These were tremendous qualities which the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, physical appearance, physical nature, power, strength, humility, shyness, haya, willingness to step in and help others, willingness to stand up for the weak and the downtrodden. But at the, uh, but at the same time, so kind, so caring, so sincere and genuine, not wanting anything in return from other people. Now, an interesting fact about Musa alayhi salam was how powerful he was in debate and dialogue. You will see from the story of Musa alayhi salam, he is in the palace of Pharaoh and he is challenging the Pharaoh. Inna rasula rabbik fa'arsil ma'ana bani Israel wa la tu'adhibhum. We are the messengers of your Lord, of your Lord. So release Bani Israel from your clutches, from your oppression and your torture, and do not persecute them. You need to understand the history that Bani Israel were completely enslaved by the Pharaoh. They were slaughtered every other year. Their baby sons were slaughtered by the Pharaoh. He had had a kind of premonition that some, a son from Bani Israel would destroy his kingdom. So he immediately instituted the practice that every other year, when a baby boy was born, they would be slaughtered by the soldiers of Pharaoh. Ibn Kathir mentions that the uh, soldiers, uh, that the women of the Egyptians, they would keep an eye on which of the women of Bani Israel are pregnant. And when it came to the time of delivery, the soldiers would turn up, they would force their way into their tents, and they would check. If it is a baby girl, they would let them live. But if it was a baby boy, they would cut their throats on the spot. The only reason he let the boys live one year and slaughter them the other year was so that the workforce for the building of his lavish uh, palaces and uh, religious uh, temples uh, would, be, uh, would be intact or there would be at least enough men to supply the workforce. So Musa alayhi salam uh, comes from this background of standing up for people who have been oppressed and persecuted. Now when he... Uh, uh, when he dialogued with uh, Pharaoh, he was so confident, so bold. And this quality of being strong in dialogue can be also seen with Adam alayhi salam. The Prophet ﷺ described a dialogue that Prophet Musa and Adam alayhi salam have in Jannah, where the Prophet Musa alayhi salam actually blames Adam. You're the reason why we are expelled from paradise. Adam responds and actually defeats him, but it shows his confidence, uh, his uh, strength of mind, and his eloquence in being able to convey his message and convey his thoughts. Now, in fact, from a young age, the Prophet Musa alayhi salam, he had a speech impediment. According to one narration, uh, when he was a baby, he grabbed the beard of Pharaoh and pulled him down. And Pharaoh was so incensed that he wanted to kill the young baby Musa alayhi salam. But then they said he's just a baby and the Pharaoh set up a kind of test for him to see whether he actually knows what he's doing or not. In one bowl, a f uh, some sweets were presented and in another bowl, some hot coal was presented and the baby was allowed to crawl and choose. And according to some narrations, that Musa, the baby Musa alayhi salam actually crawled and was directed uh, by the angels towards the coal and he put the hot coal in his mouth and burnt his tongue and from that time on he had a kind of speech impediment. Now Musa alayhi salam actually in the Quran makes dua to Allah to relieve his speech impediment because he now has to call people to Islam. It's going to be difficult for him to challenge the Pharaoh in his own palace if he has a speech impediment. So in the Quran, he says, Rabbish rahli sadri wa yasirli amri wa ahlul uqdatan min lisani yafqahu qawli. Oh Allah, expand my chest, which means give me confidence, make easy for me my mission, and remove the knot from my tongue. It's a speech impediment. So my people can understand me. And the dua actually says, remove one knot from my tongue. Not make me completely eloquent, but just remove this problem I have so that my people can understand me. Allahu Akbar, Musa alayhi salam had a disability. People talk about equality, 
people talk about equal access. We have in our Quran, the Prophet Musa alayhi salam presented where he had a kind of disability, a speech impediment. And yet he is from the greatest prophets. He is a prophet who we have a strong connection with in the Quran. So who was Pharaoh? Who is this person who was the opponent for Musa alayhi salam? Now this word Pharaoh, uh, it actually comes from the name of the residence where the royal uh, lineage, uh, where the royal kind of uh, family of the pharaohs used to live. Pero means the actual palace where the pharaohs used to live. So that's where the name's derived from. Now according to uh, archaeological studies and hieroglyphic, uh, hieroglyphics which have been discovered, uh, the most likely pharaoh of Musa alayhi salam was Ramesses II. Ramesses II. He, in all likelihood, is the pharaoh of Moses because he is the only one who had a reign long enough uh, to cover the various incidents, the periods of time that Musa alayhi salam was calling to. If you actually analyze the story of Musa alayhi salam, the pharaoh slaughters uh, the babies. Uh, when Musa alayhi salam is born, Musa alayhi salam achieves prophethood at around the age of 40. And then Musa alayhi salam uh, is in exile for around 10 years. Then he comes back and he calls uh, Musa, uh, he calls Pharaoh to Islam. That's easily 50 plus years just there. The only ruler who ruled for that length of time, according to hieroglyphics which were discovered, is Ramesses II. Now, just to give you an insight into the mindset of the Pharaoh, this was truly the most arrogant tyrant of all time. Nobody else really uh, in history has claimed with such confidence, Ana rabbukum al-a'la, I am your Lord, the Most High. People make such claims. People claim to speak to God and sometimes people even claim to be God, but largely their claims are met with... Uh, laughter, uh, they are largely dismissed. But in Pharaoh's time, this was the state religion, to believe that Pharaoh is God. We know this from the story of the Mishat, the hairdresser of the daughter of Pharaoh. The hairdresser of the daughter of Pharaoh was a secret believer. And one day while she was combing the hair of the daughter of Pharaoh, she dropped her comb and she said, Bismillah. And the daughter said, do you mean my father? And she said, no, I mean Allah. She stood up for what she believed in. So her daughter reported this. Uh, the daughter reported this to Pharaoh and Pharaoh brought her in front of her and she still insisted on the truth. So the Pharaoh took her and her children and killed them in the most gruesome way possible, uh, submerged them in boiling oil just for saying Bismillah. So it was prohibited in the time of Pharaoh to mention, even mention the name of Allah because he claimed he was God. He claimed he was Allah. Now, how did he manage to pull this off? How did he manage to fool his people? How did he manage to even carry on that illusion? Today, even if you have a tyrant or a ruler, they cannot get away with saying, I am God. Nobody would really believe them. Well, there were many ways. Number one was the magicians. Banu Israel were very skilled in sihr, magic. And Pharaoh took their most skillful magicians and subjugated them and made them work for him. And they used to carry out illusions which would amaze people. They used to have these large annual gatherings. And this is the gathering where Musa alayhi salam challenged and defeated the magicians. But they used to carry out optical illusions, sihr. And they used to say, Fir'aun, We do so in the name of Pharaoh. So when people would gasp in amazement when they carried out these illusions, and they said so in the name of Pharaoh, this would give Pharaoh a supernatural kind of appearance in the eyes of the ignorant around him. Also, Pharaoh's unrestricted power, his wealth was so incredible. He would stand on the river Nile and say, these waters belong to me. And River Nile was the source of life in those days. The flooding of the River Nile would uh, bring to life the barren valleys that people used to live on and cultivate their crops on. So he continued this illusion and by building vast structures in his name, which can be seen to today. 
If you go to Egypt, most people go to visit the pyramids, but there are other monuments as well, such as the famous temples of Abul Simbel, where you will go and you will find that the actual state religion in terms of gods of the hereafter, there was like a sun god. Now on the temples, you will see a tiny sun god, which is their, uh, which was their hereafter kind of figure. But you will see colossal statues of Ramesses the second, four colossal statues. So when the god of the hereafter is a tiny sun god like this, and the, uh, the statues of the pharaoh are more than one, colossal, four of them, then that emphasized that pharaoh is even greater than the gods of the hereafter, which they used to traditionally believe in. So he claimed, Ana rabbukum al -a'la, I am your Lord the Most High. He subjugated the entire Bani Israel. He divided up his society and he profited fabulously from the wealth uh, of slavery uh, and subjugating Bani Israel. But it all came to a head when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered Musa alayhi salam to go to Pharaoh, to challenge him and to call him to believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to release Bani Israel. So the famous iconic moment from the story of Musa and Pharaoh is the parting of the sea. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala after Musa alayhi salam had called the Pharaoh and performed his miracles and it became clear that Pharaoh and his people will not believe. Allah inspired Musa alayhi salam in the dead of the night to take his people and to head towards the Red Sea. Now the Pharaoh when he was alerted as dawn approached that the people, the Bani Israel have escaped and they've escaped without his permission. He was incensed and he gathered his entire army to pursue Pharaoh. Now note, Bani Israel, they're not a guerrilla army. They don't have any weapons. They don't need an entire army to capture them. But he's so enraged, so incensed. He goes out with his entire army and he pursues Musa alayhi salam. Now Musa alayhi salam is heading towards the Red Sea. And as the sun comes up, the people of Bani Israel, they're looking behind them and they can see that the Pharaoh's army is almost catching up with them and they've lost hope and they're begging to Musa alayhi salam, where are we going? They are almost caught up with us. On the right side is mountains, on the left side is mountains and in front of us is water. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala captures the incredible moments when this happened in Surah Yunus. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us about what happened uh, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَجَاوَزْنَا بِبَنِي إِسْرَائِيلَ الْبَحْرَ فَأَتْبَعَهُمْ فِرْعَوْنُ وَجُنُودُهُ بَغْيًا وَعَدْوًا حَتَّى إِذَا أَدْرَكَهُ الْغَرَقُ قَالَ آمَنْتُ أَنَّهُ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا الَّذِي آمَنَتْ بِهِ بَنُو إِسْرَائِيلَ وَأَنَ مِنَ الْمُسْلِمِينَ This ayah describes the profound moment when uh, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered Banu Israel and Musa to head towards the sea and Pharaoh pursued him with his army in arrogance and in pride until they reached the sea. Now the sea, Musa alayhi salam, he struck his uh, staff on the sea. Musa had confidence that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would make a way out for them. They're both seeing the same scene. Bani Israel are seeing the same scene as Musa. But whereas Bani Israel have lost hope, Musa alayhi salam is confident that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will protect them, will make a way out for, for them. And Musa actually says in the Quran that my Lord is with me. He has that confidence. He has that tawakkul. He is ordered to strike the staff on the, uh, at, the, at the foot of the Red Sea. And the two sides of the sea part. And they open up like huge mountains, the Quran describes them. And Banu Israel, led by Musa, now cross through the sea. Even Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes the floor solid so it's not muddy and sticky. As they're crossing through the sea, Banu Israel beg Musa alayhi salam, strike the staff again to close the sea, or the Pharaoh and his armies will pursue us. But Musa alayhi salam has confidence in the promise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As they cross through the sea and as they arrive on the other side, they can see that Pharaoh and his armies are in close pursuit. Pharaoh declares to his people, to his soldiers, the sea has parted for me. 
He's still trying to keep that illusion up of his own divinity, of his own abilities. So he now crosses in pursuit of Pharaoh, uh, in pursuit of Musa alayhi salam. And the Quran describes that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala closed up the sea upon them and he was drowned. And in the moment he was drowning, the verse which I've just recited, he says, I believe in the, in the one that Banu Israel believe in. Subhanallah. He doesn't even have the ability or the humility to mention the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He knows now that he is going to meet Allah, which shows that for his entire life, 50 plus years as a ruler in Pharaoh, it was all a deception. It was all an illusion. He deep down always knew about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's existence. Imprinted on every soul is belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But he was not willing to mention Allah's name. He said, I believe in the one who Banu Israel believe in. Somehow he thought that he could deceive Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even at this moment. Jibreel alayhi salam told uh, uh, Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, I wish you could have seen me when I took the black mud from the bed of the Red Sea and shoved it down his mouth for fear that the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would reach him. And Allah in the Quran mentioned that he will preserve the body of Pharaoh as a sign for the rest of humanity. Because even when he died, this illusion of divinity remained until his body was washed up on the shore and people could see that this is nothing but a human being. Now today, if you go to the Museum of Cairo, you will see the body of Ramesses II still preserved. But as Allah mentions in the verse itself, most of people will not take heed. Most people visit the body uh, out of admiration for antiquity and ancient Egypt. But most people do not take admonition from the sign of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the preservation of his body. That here was the greatest tyrant of all time, washed up on the seabed, lifeless body. Now the legacy of Musa alayhi salam and the lesson for us is that when we return to our religion, then we claim the legacy of Musa alayhi salam. When we disobey our Prophet and turn away from our religion, then we're no better than Banu Israel, turning away from their Prophet, humiliating their Prophet, annoying their Prophet. So to truly reclaim the legacy of the Prophet Musa alayhi salam, we have to be loyal to our religion, we have to be loyal to our Prophet and we have to be sincere believers. It's just like the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, we have more right to Musa Alayhi Salam than you. Yes, but providing we follow the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and we are sincere and genuine as Muslims. Assalamu Alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.